Hey YouTube, Do It Yourself Junkie 369 here today and I'm going to be going over some of the tools that I purchased for working on the Vans RV10. And this is just kind of an introductory video to the tools themselves. The bare minimum that you'll need to get. I spent about $800 on tools before I even ordered the kit. <coughs> and I got just the bare minimum really to get by with. I already own some stuff that I'll introduce in later videos. This was stuff I didn't have and it'll definitely at least get you through the toolbox or the uh, practice project if you choose to do that. And, but it might come up a little short in some areas when working on the kit. So basically when you work On a, on a van's kit, there, there's uh, ba basically three families of kits. You have the RV4 and RV3, which you have to locate and drill your own holes. And then you everything newer than that, up to the RV12 and RV14, have pre-punched holes that you just line up and then match drill and then deburr. So that's uh, kits such as the RV7, 10, RV9, and I uh, seem to be forgetting one. And then the RV12 and RV14 are newer kits that the holes are punched to their finished size. So you can go directly into dimpling the holes for countersunk rivets. The only caveat to that is the RV14 uses some RV10 parts. Those will be marked as to which ones they are. And those will need to be match drilled when you're constructing that aircraft. So those of you don't don't know, you, you put your parts together, get everything assembled, go through, you match drill. So first thing you need to hold the pieces together is what's known as clecos. And a cleco is basically a temporary rivet. It has a wedge between two posts or a split post. And when you put them in the cleco pliers, which you'll need to use the clecos, that wedge gets retracted or the post gets pushed out depending on which way you want to look at it. So that way it's able to fit in the hole. And then as you release, it retracts holding the pieces tightly together just as if they were riveted. So I, pro I probably had the wrong size Clico for this, but it should give you an idea. So you compress the Clico, stick it through the hole, and then it clamps down and holds it firmly together just as if it was riveted when you release it. And you've probably seen pictures of this, of aircraft with a whole bunch of these sticking out. And you want to skip every other or every two holes. You, you need So for this assembly, you'd at least need two to make sure everything's lined up correctly. And then you'd go and you'd drill the two empty holes. And for that, you need a drill. And I'll go and do a review on this later, but I recommend a pneumatic drill for speed, the motor's not going to overheat or cause a whole lot of damage to your batteries by repeatedly draining and charging them within short periods of time. And then it's also fairly light and well balanced compared to an electric drill. So I'll do a more in-depth review on this later. But you'll need a drill with appropriate size drill bit to drill out the holes. Then you remove the Clecos. And if it's not Clecos, like let's say you start out with something with no holes in it, you can use these clamps to hold it together while you drill your first few holes. But once, once the holes are drilled and you disassemble everything, then you'll need to deburr the parts. And there's several different ways that you can deburr parts.
The, the method I went with is with a deburring tool that has replaceable blades. So this is kind of like a scraper slash knife that you just run down the edges and I'll show that more in depth later. Or you have a countersink type looking bit that goes in a handle. This is an offset one that you just spin around real quick so you stick it in the hole and do this motion and that's real great for deburring holes. So you want to deburr your projects. Uh, basically burrs and sharp edges are stress concentration points and that's where cracks start. So by removing the burrs you remove those concentration points that are going to cause cracks later when the airframe's vibrating such as during flying. And then once that step's done and another option that a lot of people are going with is 3M wheels for deburring. So they stick on a grinder. Uh, that wheel is about $100 for one. I haven't bought it. I probably will though. I've used them in the past. I, I just don't have any currently. I really like using them, but I didn't want to spend $100 on a consumable wheel. It's a really tough uh, purchase to make. But it will save you a lot of time over deburring the old fashioned fashion method. Another way to do deburring is to use files which I didn't purchase any of those in this purchase because I already own some. Anyway now that the parts deburred you stick it back together with the Clecos and then you do riveting unless it needs countersink. A countersink or a dimple and there's couple different ways to dimple depending on what it is. Small parts you can use this hand squeezer with a set of dimple dies. For large parts such as the skin you can use this long arm dimpler that mounts to the table and you stick the skin in there and there's a post here with the other dimple die on it. You stick that down the hole and you hit it with a hammer which it, there's two or three different types of ways of doing that. Just same thing with the hand squeezer. A lot of people buy pneumatic squeezers. I'll do more in-depth reviews on most of these aircraft specific tools later. Stuff that's normally not in your garage. And if you need to countersink, you'll have a countersink bit. And it's a real good idea deal to use this micro stop uh, countersink tool. Basically what that does is you set it and you press down while you're drilling and then you hit a stop and that sets your depth of your countersink so you don't go too deep with it. So there's that tool and then from there you, you move on to riveting and the hand squeezer or pneumatic squeezer if you have that can be used for riveting. Basically you put the two rivet dies in there, put the rivet in the metal hold the rivet in place as you squeeze down and compress the other side of the rivet or and there's a pneumatic version instead of using your hand to actuate it it does the same motion just with air pressure and a lever or a valve instead of actually squeezing it like a pair of scissors and then the other option for riveting is a rivet, rivet gun. And a rivet gun, the size you want to get is probably 3x or 2x. I went with 3x because it's a little bit easier on larger rivets. And this one's specifically supposed to be kind of a 2x gun control wise, but with a, enough power to behave like a 3x gun. So it's kind of a good combination of both and I'll do a more in-depth review of that later. And depending on what type of rivet you're driving, you'll have a rivet set here. This one's for a domed rivet instead of a flush rivet. And on the initial purchase you want to buy, I'll, I'll put a list down below of what sizes of everything I got, exactly what I got to start out with. This is a back rivet. So instead of putting your rivet gun on the manufacturer head, you put the manufacturer head down on a steel plate on your bench and then you go along with this and make the shop heads 
using your back rivet attachment so definitely want to have that it speeds up stuff here's another dome rivet just larger size and then the flat or the flush rivet set you'll definitely want one of those and and then you'll want dimple dies and some rivet sets domed and flat for your pneumatic or your hand squeezer and I'll list specific sizes that I started out with and every time I use something new I'll point out exactly what I'm using so you know roughly how far into the build you're going to need something and then last thing you need for riveting that you probably don't have in your shop is some sort of bucking bars and it used to be that you bought a lot of bucking bars of different sizes and shapes to fit into different areas because normally they're quite large this is a tungsten bucking bar so you get all the weight of a large bucking bar in a really small package and since this can fit into tighter spaces you don't have to buy a whole lot of different bucking bars of different shapes so I only bought one to start out with and that's bare minimum what you need to get started there's a few other tools that I went out and purchased today that I'll cover in the first build video basically I read through the plans kind of got an idea of what I needed coming up and bought those today so again there's a link down in the description that will have or in the description I'll put the different sizes and how many of each item that I bought I'll put a link of I got all this stuff from ATS but I'll put Amazon links too. ATS is on Amazon and you can just go on there get it off there and that's really great especially if you have Prime you can pick up free shipping if your order is over a certain amount and ATS is great because they're always doing some sort of sale as long as there's like a holiday like maybe it's National Donut Day they have a weird sale for that for some reason and one thing real quick before I end the video that I didn't cover is drill bits you'll need quite a few drill bits I got some number 40 and some number 30 those are used on most of the holes on the aircraft more than anything else and I think these are a package of six yep so there's six in each of these of each size so that that's just the basic aircraft specific tools that you probably don't have in your garage that you'll want to pick up about the same time you pick up your kit or maybe a little bit before if you want to get familiar with them and or buy them and this should get you through like I said the practice project or the toolbox no problem hope you liked the video please hit the thumbs up button if you did make sure to subscribe so you can watch this project as it comes along and uh, the other link down there for my project tracker will give you exact hours that I have done to the project like what step I'm and I up that update it every day that I work on the plane so it's more update than my uh, videos are my videos might lag behind a little bit and then also in there I put what I've paid so far for different tools uh, the kit shipping prices anything that I've spent towards this I put it in there because I want to get a real accurate track of how much this cost because it seems like people just guess at how much they spent most of the times and I feel like their estimates are fairly inaccurate the, the numbers they're giving don't quite jive with the numbers that I get when I, I price out this project um, which kind of worries me a little bit so I wanted to get a, a real accurate count of what it would cost to build the aircraft to give you guys a better idea how to estimate your project cost. Um, exact number of hours because Vans says you can have like 60 to 40 percent, 40 percent to 60% time difference between different people, and nobody really tracks accurately how much time they just know they started one day and ended another day so they kind of guess on total time so I'm tracking exactly down to the tenth of an hour how much time I spend on each task and how long the total project has taken and I split those times up into prep work like building EEA tables actual build where I'm working on the kit or prep or uh, admin work for example calling and getting missing pieces replaced or 
something of that sort or doing research towards something that I'm not familiar with so that's the other link down there I hope you liked the video and thanks for watching